Grains are the largest single source of calories in the world, and here, in the US and Canada, wheat is the most widely consumed grain. In only recent years, research has begun to demonstrate that in our efforts to breed high-yielding wheat suited to large-scale food manufacturing, we've sacrificed wheat's most meaningful qualities. What role might we play to ensure that the wheat we eat nurtures and sustains us as best it can? I'm John Steinman. Join me for the next half hour as we deconstruct your dinner. Today, we deconstruct wheat. In Seattle, Washington, the appreciation of good food can be seen at the city's many farmers markets and its many amazing restaurants. Here, in a popular neighborhood of the city, Chef John Sundstrom showcases the flavors of the region. Lark is a 50-seat restaurant on Capitol Hill in Seattle. From the beginning, the whole idea was to really be a welcoming, warm place that served great quality food. What we wanted to do from the very beginning was find a way to connect with all of those artisanal producers and suppliers that I've been working you know, for years to develop and, and structure the menu so that we can be very flexible. So we change the menu every week. I really try to get people to realize where the fruit comes from. Certainly, I'm gonna do really exciting and delicious things when you come to my restaurant, but I have to have good quality um, ingredients to start with. John has built a reputation in Seattle for his use of local ingredients, but unique among chefs is his source of wheat, both at the restaurant and at home. John invites me into his home, where he's preparing one of his favorite dishes, and wheat is the star. Why is wheat such an important ingredient for you? My grandmother was a really great baker, so we always had wonderful baked goods uh, around the house. So, you know, wheat is is part of who we are as, uh, as humans, pretty much. I'm cooking it almost like a pilaf right now. So, um, sauteing the onions in some olive oil and kind of coating the, uh, the, the wheat with the, uh, the fat. For John, eating locally also means eating local wheat grown in Washington's Meadow Valley. With that grain, John mills his own flour for crackers and pasta, and he cooks the whole grain like rice. But eating local wheat is anything but the norm. Here in North America, wheat has become a globally traded commodity, and the wheat we eat comes from every corner of the globe to be processed at large industrial scale mills. So does the origin of our wheat really make a difference? To truly appreciate this meal, I'd like to find out. Located north of Seattle at a modern research center, Stephen Jones breeds 40,000 types of wheat. Breeding is one of the first and most important stages in the production of this food. So in Washington state, well over 90% of the wheat that's grown leaves the state and leaves the country. Wheat for industrial market is, is pretty strictly controlled and, and a, um, it goes through a, a a bottleneck in a way where it has to meet certain strength of the dough requirements and, and things like that. Um, what's not looked at is the nutritional value and flavor points. In a big industrial type of system, those actually aren't important, surprisingly, they're not. It's hard to believe that with all of the advancements in agriculture, somewhere along the way, nutrition and flavor were forgotten. To be certain, we can travel across the Cascades to the heart of Washington wheat, the Palouse. The food grown here is for an industrial, global market. And helping support this model is another Washington State University breeding center. Like Stephen Jones, researcher Aaron Carter is also a wheat breeder, but their priorities are much different. What I'm looking at in my job as a plant breeder is being able to sustain the profitability of the crop, so making sure there's high, high yield potential with those varieties. As far as the potential for increasing the nutritional composition of wheat, is that something that has been front and center with wheat breeding? Increasing the nutritional content really hasn't been front and center, I would say. Yield really turns to be our number one. Um, priority and looking for those lines that really do have the highest yield potential. So we'll begin to throw them away if they don't have high yield potential. 
if they don't have good end use quality, if they don't have the disease resistance, we're getting rid of the material we know absolutely won't make it in the marketplace. The beauty of breeding is you get what you select for. So if what you select for is yield, that's what you're going to get. What do you lose? What you may lose in there is what you have not selected for. And if you have not selected for the amount of iron and zinc and selenium in your wheat, by chance you can lose it. To learn more about the loss of nutrients in wheat, I traveled to Houston, Texas, the home of retired biochemist Dr. Don Davis. In 2004, Don co-authored a study which documented nutrient declines between 1950 and 1999 in 43 fruits and vegetables. It was then he also began looking into wheat. I became aware of declines in wheat when I was writing the paper for our 2004 study. It's called the Broad Bulk Wheat Experiment, where they, for 160 years, they had planted wheat, harvested it, collected grain samples and soil samples and archived them. And then in 2008, they analyzed them and found that yields were pretty constant up until 1968. The mineral contents were constant until then. In the 60s, the, the beginning of the, the Green Revolution, everyone wanted very short wheats because they thought they could, well, just pump more nitrogen on it, get more yield, and, and go. That actually first originated here at WSU with Orville Vogel. He brought over the dwarfing genes in some Japanese wheat lines and began putting them into wheat varieties that were probably as tall as I were that the farmers were growing. And the yields went up by two or three fold. It was considered to be a huge triumph, uh, but we didn't know then what we know now. All of a sudden, big changes happened and uh, mineral declines uh, set in uh, about 1% a year. It doesn't sound like a lot, but over uh, 40 years, it adds up to a considerable decline in minerals. What we've shown is that the older wheats as a group do have higher nutritional value than the more modern wheats. Uh, we've published this in scientific journals. Uh, what we've also shown is that there's no direct correlation or negative correlation between yield and nutritional value. What that means is we can have high yielding wheats that have a high nutritional value as measured by micronutrients, iron, zinc, selenium. Um, we just have to breed for it. And, and that really hasn't been done until very recently. The nutritional value of wheat doesn't end in the field. Wheat is very often processed into flour, and not all flour mills are created equal. From industrial mills to small organic mills serving local communities, the process of milling does impact the nutrition and flavor of our wheat. If you're milling it fresh, as a 100% whole wheat product that you're baking bread out of, those nutrients are there, including flavors and other things. If it's going through a roller mill and the bran and the germ is gone and all you have is white flour, those nutrients have been diminished. Um, it brings up an important point too, is, is all professional breeders breed for low ash. What ash is are, are little flecks that get in the white flour. Those are the micronutrients. We've been breeding against ash. We've been breeding against these micronutrients. Immediately, you see the difference in color. You see the difference in height. By breeding outside of the commodity market, Stephen Jones is responding to these downward nutritional trends and ushering in a new era of wheat breeding. Stephen invites local millers and bakers to work with these new varieties. And this more inclusive model ensures that wheat can establish itself within a local food system. And by working directly with, with craft bakers and millers and small scale type of operations, we also have more uh, leeway into how we define wheat as a, as a crop and as a product. I think the time is right for wheat being considered a local food. Examining our relationship to wheat can remind us of just how disconnected we've become from the people and processes our food passes through. While it is easy to find flour from an industrial scale mill like this one here, a lesser explored option is the one designed by individuals and communities. When we return, we travel into the mountains of British Columbia, where two communities have come together to forge a unique partnership. I'm 
here in the Creston Valley of British Columbia, standing within a very significant crop. This is red fife wheat, which fed Canadians from coast to coast between 1860 and 1900. It's a variety that's been replaced by more modern varieties, but is now experiencing a rebirth. This particular field of red fife is also unique in that it's part of Canada's very first community-supported agriculture project for grain. In fact, it's from this very farm that I've been sourcing my grain for the past five years. The idea for the project came from Nelson's Matt Lowe, who spends a lot of time thinking about food. In 2007, the uh, Kootenai Co-op was a participant in the Eat Local Challenge. So I decided to eat locally for one day a week. I realized that I could source a lot of my foods locally, but grains, um, cereals, pastas, breads, there was no local source of grains. Matt Lowe responded to this void in his local diet by initiating an immediate search in the nearby Creston Valley, an area which had once been very active in the production of grain. One of the farmers found was Roy Lawrence. Wheat for local consumption, I really don't know as it existed. It probably existed when the early settlers came here because that's what they sustained themselves with. But in, in my time frame, it's been more growing commercial grain for large volumes and shipping it to flour mills, mostly in Alberta. Probably a year and a half before we decided to go with organic, there was a, a spike in the, in the wheat price and uh, we thought, oh boy, we're gonna rain whole pile of money, right? Before we got to seeding that year, the, 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 uh, the fertilizer price went up just the same amount. And so if you did your pencil work, you would end up making exactly what you did before. And so at that point, I got very disgusted with the whole system that we were dealing with. And just about that time, Matt and, and Brenda uh, approached us with the idea of growing for a CSA. Community supported agriculture. It's a model that invites eaters to pay the farmer at the beginning of the season when the farmer needs the money most. And the farmer sets the price, meaning Roy likely receives more per pound for his wheat than any other wheat farmer in North America. It's a wonderful thing where we, we share risk. So if I had a crop failure, um, I would still get uh, paid, which is unheard of in, in any commercial sector. There, there, Never before have I met uh, a group of people that have been concerned about me. Um, that's, that's a really nice feeling. Once the wheat is bagged and ready for distribution, another incredible effort is made by CSA members to transport their wheat from the Creston Valley to Nelson. Kootenay Lake is one of the largest lakes in British Columbia, and that gave Jay Blackmore and the Kootenay Lake Sailing Association an idea. I read in the paper that the, the harvest was successful and they were going to be bringing this grain back to Nelson. And I thought, wow, why truck it over the highest mountain pass in Canada when we can sail to Creston? When I heard about the sailing, I thought it was a crazy idea. But in the end, it turned out to be a, a great idea. When I get down to the, to the dock and there's uh, just a, like a bunch of ants going crazy, carrying these bags onto the, onto the sailboats, everybody's having fun. It brings me back to thinking about, uh, you know, the old timers that are talking about harvest time when everybody would get together and, and do something. It brings people together, which, which is uh, much needed in our society. For two years now, this three-day journey brings along local chef Jesse Phillips, who prepares freshly made pasta for each crew. The pasta flour is from the previous year's harvest, and this now annual tradition is a reminder of how food culture does not have to be handed down from the past, but can be created right within our own communities. Waiting at the docks in Nelson are family, friends, and members of the CSA awaiting their wheat. One of those members is Natalka Podstowski. The availability of locally grown grain has inspired a new relationship to wheat for Natalka and her family. Pre-grain CSA, I would say my relationship to wheat was just a really unconscious one. I never thought of what it looked like before it became flour. I would buy all-purpose white flour. So we bought our own grain mill 
Uh, it seemed to be the best option for the amount of grain we had and the best option for freshness. I'm of the opinion that not only whole grains but sourdoughs are the way to go for our health and my family's health. I feel like we're getting a lot more out of our food as far as nutrients. There we go. That's it. And can you stir it up? My favorite way to use sourdough is definitely pancakes. There you go. So I'll stir it, okay? Okay. Three tablespoons. I'll stir it up. Natalka offers an example of how we can all become active participants in our local food system. The Kootenai Co-op in Nelson receives its share of sailboat delivered wheat for the store's extensive bulk section. For this community, local wheat is here to stay. The evolution of our food system over recent decades has left our relationship to wheat quite disconnected from its origins. But as we've discovered, reconnecting can be surprisingly fun. Meeting your grain farmer or transporting your pancake ingredients by sailboat, this food can inspire a substantially different way of life and a greater sense of community. When we return, we travel back to Seattle, Washington to learn about Chef John Sundstrom's relationship to his source of wheat and discover how we can prepare homemade foods like pasta and crackers instead of relying on the manufactured options at the supermarket. When we embark on the journey of uncovering the origins of our food, what we discover can inspire significant changes to what and how we eat. With wheat being such an important part of our diets, it's no wonder that deconstructing this food can encourage us to want to know our farmer, to know our miller, or to transport grain from farm to plate via sailboat. But what role can our kitchens play on this journey? Here at Lurk in Seattle, Chef John Sundstrom uses a locally grown ancient variety of wheat. Down the road in his kitchen at home, John also uses wheat as a whole grain. He uses it to make pasta, and he even uses it to make crackers for his family. When it comes to flour, I think people just don't really, you know, they're so disconnected from their food supply, where, you know, thinking of local flour being milled, you know, it just, I think, probably doesn't enter into most people's consciousness. Many years ago, John Sundstrom was introduced to Bluebird Grain Farms in the nearby Meadow Valley. With all of the varieties of wheat to choose from, Bluebird chose to specialize in growing emmer, a more nutritious and flavorful wheat. Emmer is the true ancient grain. It's the mother of all wheats. It's dated 10,000 years back. This was the first emmer field here for Bluebird. And once we started growing it, I just started falling in love with it. And our tone has not changed. It's a wonderful grain, very nutrient dense, very high in sugars, quite low in gluten and we first tried to market, it was mostly to chefs because they knew what it was. I used to buy my emmer from Italy. It was a great product. I was supporting a small farm in Italy, you know, very artisanally produced. But once somebody like Bluebird came, came along, it was sort of like this great eye-opening moment. Okay, now I can buy beautiful emmer, rye, uh, wheat products from, you know, just a couple hours away um, and still with those same ethical concerns, you know, a small farm, small production, uh, taking care of the land, all of that. And to me, even more than organic certification these days, um, getting to know a farmer and getting to know what their long-term plan is kind of is a higher priority. We differ in that we are constantly building our soils. It's not just about volume. So if you look here, like this one should come apart. These are the individual seeds. And actually inside of these, if you pinch them, will be the mature ones will have two grains. And so we do that process at the granary. This small operation does it all removing the hulls, sorting the grain by size with a custom-designed gravity table, preserving the grains whole, or milling them on site into flour. Bluebird Grains is a working example of the future of local wheat in our communities, a business which can supply local bakeries, independent grocery stores, and chefs. Sam Lucy believes that local and older varieties of wheat simply taste better. But what does good wheat taste like? I travel to the small community of Edison, Washington to find out from a Bluebird customer. Baker Scott Mangold insists that local and freshly milled wheat is a recipe for flavor. 
one of our mottos here at the Bread Farm is that we're changing the world one loaf at a time. And the ways that we're doing that are by trying to source grains locally so that we're not asking people to transport our grains from the center of this country. From the start, uh, there's been a noticeable flavor component that we were not expecting, and it's been a pleasant surprise. With bread being one of the best ways to compare the flavor of wheat, Chef John Sundstrom invites Scott into his kitchen at Lark, so we can all answer this question. Is local, freshly milled heritage wheat more flavorful? Tell us a little bit about what you've prepared here. Sure, both of these breads were made with the exact same formulation, so the only difference is the wheat that we've used. This one here is made with uh, a local hard red wheat, and then this is straight from the grocery store shelf, a large commercial miller, uh, all whole wheat flour as well. When you take a smell of both of these, John, what are you smelling? Well, the, the local wheat has that sweet, rich, kind of nutty scent. Uh, I'm not really getting much off of this other than kind of a, a toasty smell, which I would think is just, you know, the, the crust. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm not really getting any sweetness. Shall we take a taste? Let's try. When I taste wine, I start with the least flavorful, so I'm gonna... Mm -hmm. Well, what I notice is it, it's really kind of an echo of the fragrance. The local milled uh, wheat is, is sweeter, uh, a little deeper flavor. Well, I agree with John in the, in the conventional wheat. Uh, it's, it's a fine loaf of bread. Uh, it tastes good, but there's nothing special about it. Well, I think this has been a great appetizer to that amazing meal that you have waiting for us. Let's head over to your place, John. All right, let's go. There you go, John. Wow, Chef, thanks. So this is uh, Bluebird Grains Faro with uh, kind of a, a creamy sauce. It's usually just cream or mascarpone is what I use to finish it. It's all vegetarian. We just use water when we cook the farro. Uh, we've got some green beans and cherry tomatoes. Bon appetit, chef. Thank you very much. Amazing how soft the emmer is. I always think whole grains is hard or at least crunchy, but this is it's just like rice. The power to reconstruct the food system is truly in our hands. It's from our efforts that we can ensure the availability of more nutritious and flavorful wheat and support farmers with a fair price. A great place to begin this journey is at iChannel.ca, where Chef John Sundstrom offers step-by-step -step instruction on how to prepare fresh pasta or bake crackers at home. People who cook at home have a huge role to play because for most of these farms to make it, they have to have kind of a, a three-pronged approach, and that's um, CSAs, so Community Supported Agriculture, restaurants, and then farmers markets. Two out of three of those elements are basically the home cook. We import flour to this community. Someone else has captured value. We're exporting wheat and we're importing flour. That doesn't make sense economically. So we see it as a as a adding vitality back to our small communities which which need it. Farmers get paid for their yield. Ideally, we would be able to pay farmers by the nutrient content of their crops. And if we could do that, immediately things would really change. When I was in the commercial uh, business, I, I didn't believe there was a market at all out there for anything organic. And my, my farming neighbors laughed at me and said, you're absolutely crazy for thinking about this. And uh, um, I said, well, I, I just, I gotta try it anyway. And uh, it's, it's been one of the most wonderful experiences that I've had. Mm -hmm.